real identity exists in the virtual world. Can you guys say what your note is about? <laughs> yeah, my answer was about Twitter because my personality changed when I got on Twitter and I became a different, and then I became that person when I went to tweet up events that I had, I would suddenly step into that identity that I created. It's like a persona almost. So my answer was absolutely, you don't even need a body. It was all words, you know, there's no, there is a picture, but that's it. Yeah, especially in, this, in, in the online world now, I mean, how people see you online is how they see your identity. They interact with you more online than they do in, in real life. So, I mean, that's almost more of a real identity than your When there was bulletin boards and groups, um, I belonged to a group and, and um, got to know a lot of people without even pictures because we didn't have a graphical user interface at that time. And the first time we met people, there was that second or less of cognitive dissonance when I would meet a person in the physical world and they didn't really match with what I thought their personality was. But then that just went away because as soon as they started talking, that they were the person that I knew online. And so it didn't matter. I definitely had the opposite experience too where I've talked to someone online for years without meeting them and then meet them and have them seem like a completely different person than the person I had known online. And not like they were even lying or trying to make themselves different. Um, it just interacting with them in a physical space. Um, I realized that they were very, just felt different than the online had felt. And while I liked their online person, I didn't like better their real life person. And then you and then you disengage from the physical world. I, I think it's, there's some danger in. That we can now actualize beyond our, our psyche, beyond your chemical balance in your brain, that you can go beyond creating other people. It's it's a it's a whole it's a whole door. Do people come back? Yeah, I read a really weird story last year about a couple in Shanghai whose real baby died because they were spending all this time taking care of their second life baby or like some virtual baby game program um, and and that's where that loss happens you know where that disconnect happens like that's a threshold that gets passed through so that's happened yeah I mean I mean according to my news source so it wasn't <laughs> so they weren't schizophrenic they were literally playing the virtual game they were yeah, that shit was um, I'm curious, who has, I don't know, do you play Second Life or do you live Second Life? What, what's the verb? That's a good who has, I wanna, Who has I an avatar? Try it I know. <laughs> you don't have to admit it. I think you go in. Right? Yeah. You go in. Yeah. yeah. You go in I mean, I Second Life. I only took the tutorial, learn how to move the body, explore a couple of places. And, it, and that was like three years ago. So I didn't spend a lot of time there. I also realized quickly that in order to make things happen, you know, that financial side was very important. Like you can buy things and clothes, and it, but basically there was a market economy just like the one outside the world. So I figured, well, I mean, I was really struggling paying my rent in the first life. And right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not as practical well, to be in yeah. that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like we just don't have to as much. You know what I mean? So whereas that like terrifies my core, I think that's kind of like what's going on. <laughs> as long as the electrical grid is up and running. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But but then it goes down and the body comes back. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all conditional. One earthquake, one earthquake away. Do y'all think customization is more of like a utilitarian act or more a creative act? That was something I was thinking about in both conversations. You know what I mean? Like I've I think heard Amos was saying it wasn't for him. Right. And Amos it, talks about it more right. like I would say utilitarian, like to survive. You know what I mean? But I wonder if this might just have that also capitalist cling to it, maybe. Like, and I, what you sort like of upgrade pinpoint. or something? Yeah, <laughs> like it's, you know, and it has this presumption that you are this sort of very <laughs> individual <laughs> that has agents yeah, and, and capable of sort of, you know, 
transforming yourself or your body into yeah. whatever you want it to be. Yeah. Yeah. So it has this it implies choice. <laughs> and and what I in a way Amos was sort of pinpointing I guess is also that you might not always feel that you have a choice in a way that your body sort of overcome or and for all sort of economic reasons you might not be able to sort of have be able to customize your body in, in various ways. One second life you, you, as long as you can access it in yeah. the computer you can be whatever you yeah. want to be and Although, yeah. other things still cost money. It's, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, sure. Well because a lot of people live there to do art and they charge for what they do. So actually buying buying uh, jewelry or tattoos in the second life actually does cost money. The good ones. And it, it is in our nature to strive for our best, so the fact that things... There's, there's a lot of freedoms that you actually don't have in the virtual world, which are very... I find very cool, because it shows that we essentially construct the world ourselves and have these limits. So even, even virtual worlds have to have certain types of constraints on them, inevitably. How do you make money, or how do you acquire money? Um, in Second Life, what you do is you do something like, uh, like, like, like say, you make, uh, say you make jewelry in Second Life. You actually, you actually craft it. You, you actually make it yourself. Like you, it just, you can kind of imagine it's like Legos. It's like you twist these little pieces of digital material and you paint them and stuff. But because they're so detailed, it's a very artistic act. So if, if people spend hundreds of thousands of hours on pieces of art in the same way that they would here. And then you take that and you sell it for a currency which is called Linden Dollars inside Second Life, but for all intents and purposes it might as well be Euros because there are many, many websites you can go to and just exchange that currency, including ours, and just exchange that currency back to US dollars. So there are thousands of people whose full-time primary living is making uh, mostly clothing, furniture, jewelry, accessories, things like that inside Second Life. And the ones that are famous and very good at it and make, you know, there are ones that make millions of dollars U.S. a year doing it and they're famous people. Like if you run into them, they're very cool designers that are, you know, the best in the second one. I don't spend any time on Manhunt. So are you saying that Manhunt man man is to the bathhouse what Amazon is to the independent bookstore? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There's no going back, man. Yeah. What's going to happen next? <laughs> and I was thinking, that's so ironic, because it's exactly the opposite of what that really is, right? It's, it's virtual, it's, it's actually not permanent, it could go away in a second, you know, I mean, uh, I know it's technology and the server goes down and suddenly, you know, you don't have, you don't have an environment that's permanent, but the psychological idea of building permanence in a space that's virtual is really an interesting idea to me. You know, like, like, can I get something out of that psychologically that I'm not finding in my own life around the concept of something? Mm -hmm. I think Amos, you made the point about how when you, you put the journal of trans male culture and you didn't know what it was yet, but that yeah. I created it. It sounded I, good. Yeah, I mean, I feel like... I like culture. It's, I mean, it was like, it's totally, like, you, you design, it's like life imitates art. I mean, I feel yeah. like I'm trying to live up to my, like, illustrious Facebook profile, you know? It's like, I don't really, I'm not, you know, I say I'm a writer, but I, like, you know, write, like, stone in my bed, like, 15 minutes every couple months. <laughs> but, um, but it's groovy stuff. But it's so good. <laughs> so yeah, you you strive to become what you're what you're propagating out into the world, for better or for worse. So do, so do all these um, social networking technologies help us be like have like be aspirational? Like you know what I mean? We get to inspire us. Does it help us aspire to be better people? I think I think it does. But I also think that the flip side of that, and I just read this really interesting article about how Twitter and Facebook are. Um, creating and, and kind of um, contributing to this culture of jealousy or like yes. and like you see people like I like follow all these like cool people on Twitter and they're just like basically using it as like a text message system where they're at like these cool parties and stuff and I'm just like I'm just kind of like in like my corner like looking at it like don't in my bed following these cool people and it's like I'm I'm aspiring to that but also like kind of sinking deeper into my, like, weird yeah. But was that really new? I there mean, are nightclubs in Second Life where people, real where like every Friday night at nine o'clock, people yeah. will put on a show, a, 
people from all over the world will log in and actually sing. You, right? you, heard you can have a voice. And, Art happens yeah, you can sing. sing. So you, people do. Art happens. And from Art happens. Oh, and people, it's, people it's just show up at the nightclub and hang out and yeah. a singer. Like I, I've done that actually. Somebody will sing online right into a microphone yeah. and it plays. Yep. Yeah. Yes. And you can hear yeah. singers from around the world. Yeah. In yeah, the there, are, there are numerous. So you might want to do that. So and again, I think we live in such a place. We forget what it's like to be out Yeah. It's almost like the question of why would you go to Second Life is almost like the question of like why would you go to museum? Because it's not really anymore. It's not really a much different question. Maybe you have business there. Maybe you have relatives there. Maybe you, have, you know. Maybe you met a girl online who lives in New Zealand, and now you want to go there. I mean, it's, it's like the same thing. The second Life is pretty. It's, it's pretty neutral palette. It, it just basically kind of is a place. The only downside of Second Life is that you know your your nerve endings don't terminate at the edges of your avatar. I mean, it would be. We're not all the way projected into there yet. So it's impoverished in that sense. You can only use your voice, your mouse, your hand on the mouse. Um, there's cool stuff like in Second Life, you haven't seen this, it's just, this is my background, is physics and the brain and computer interface and stuff. You know, like when, when you move your cursor around the screen, this just gives you an idea of what I was trying to say, that, that feeling of being near someone that's weird. When you move your cursor, your avatar follows where that cursor is to everybody else. So that's one of the examples that you get this very intense sense of like being with other people. We're sort of trying to carry the interface. We're trying to pull you into the computer as much as we can. But what? I feel like I'm very nervous, sort of like ungrounded. It sounds like really San Francisco, but it's really hard to focus. Even you two, like bouncing your focus yeah. back and forth, like it reads as uncertain, it reads as not present, it reads yeah. as not intimate or real or like. Yeah. And those, I mean, that's a cost, you know, to this. And it's a cost, I'm sure, there's some yeah. SL cost too. But I mean, like an example would be you will never get to know Japanese people in your life, period, <laughs> full stop. You don't have the money. I mean, you know what I mean? Most people in the United States, circa 2012, still will never know people in Japan. They, they will know them only as, as news stories. But, but in Second Life, you can know them. Like, it's eerie. Like, I've definitely hung out and talked to people in Japan. And, and it's been just amazing because they're like artists. You know, you walk into their house in Second Life and it's totally Japanese because it's a Japanese guy who built the place. Okay, Cupid is a, is the, is a sort of uh, the. Uh, kind of free online dating. It's sort of like someone reverse engineered eHarmony and put it up for free so that anyone could basically use it as a way to find other people that they were interested in. Um, but it's, yeah, it's quasi, it's semi anonymous, right? Or mostly anonymous. And it's, it is, you're projecting a self that you're hoping that someone will see and, and click on. And that might lead to something, right? Whatever it is that you're desiring. So at, at what all these issues of genuineness and reality of like, well, what do I want people to see when they see me? What picture do I use? What what books am I reading? Like, where do I go on a Friday night? You know, <laughs> do I like, tell the truth? Do I tell the truth? Yeah. And then they meet me. And then they go, wait a minute, you're not that guy. I had this other picture of that guy when I read it. So, so it, it's, it's, it's such an interesting, and they, they are like such data nerds about like how like who's most successful in projecting themselves that leads to other people clicking on them and relationships or whatever. So definitely interesting space, the whole like finding partners and finding finding um, other people that you connect with using this projected self that leads to an actual physical meeting, hopefully at some point. yourself on Second Life or on Facebook or, you know, on Manhunt. Um, but it still takes a form. Virtual or real, you mean? Like that same kind of crazily academic thing that just wants to have everything to be the hat <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. Have no yeah. bodies, bodies are dirty, <laughs> yeah. and they're weird yeah. and problematic, and we hate them, and that's why people who do physical labor with their bodies get paid nothing, people who think only with their heads and pretend they have no bodies. Get lots of, I mean, like, I just feel like I, it's hard to have that conversation without thinking of this whole history of just, like, hating the physical body and prizing the mind as if we aren't all sitting here in our bodies. Do you know what I mean? It just seems like sometimes it's just a way to escape 
this like very basic I physical totally self-loathing, you know yeah. what I mean? And like we're making this whole world around escaping yeah. our bodies and making it sound really smart. So it starts to become, you know that idea of the uncanny valley? Do you know that concept, the uncanny valley? The, the place where uh, an android becomes more and more real to the point where it becomes so creepy you don't want to, you know, and then, then it becomes super real or something, I don't know. Anyway, I think that like the this, you, you don't you don't you don't have any response to these avatars as real people, but the technology will be there soon. Or it starts to be convincing. Yeah, I think it's already there, right? Yeah. But in Second Life, if you go up to another avatar and you get in their face, they're gonna back off. So you're already having these uh, Preliminary I guess. physical responses. Right. To but so you can still just pull the plug. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's dangerous. It's, it's not dangerous, right? right. Yeah. That's so I think it's what's interesting when we're talking about the things like uh, treating soldiers with PS, uh, PTSD, PTSD, post-traumatic stress. Uh, it's like I think the the way humans. It's like I can see uses for this beyond just social um, implications, where people are uh, going through the motions of regular human behaviors and kind of finding, I guess that's where people, you know, it seems like a lot of the quotes that are coming out really, like this has changed my life, the way I interact with people, and more outgoing. It seems in a lot of ways, uh, and I don't mean this in a negative sense, but a way for people to uh, figure out how they want their real life to be by going through the motions in a, in a safe environment, right? Yeah. You know, so they, they can try things out and do things here that they might actually secretly want to be doing in real life. Yeah, it seems like to me like that was a big, like the person going out of the grocery store. Yeah, like that's yeah. that's really great to hear. I mean, there's a, that's just one end, end angle of it, I guess. How do you experience yourself? You understand yourself from a physical, like a body, physical based reality, even if it's in Second Life, even if it's, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. the second part of the question, like about the real identity exists in the virtual world, I think that that is true and that that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen and met people on, people who exist on Facebook who are. Um, you know, young trans people who are not out in their physical life to their family, to their, even their friends. They have friends online, they have, they're like very isolated, they have a community <coughs> online of people that they can talk to about like wanting to transition and you know what the steps they should take are, etc. And just having a support network. And their real identity online is this other person that they want to physically become. It's like... Changing your persona, changing what you look like, depends on your location. So he changed. He changed what he looked like in Second Life, and because he changed what he looked like in Second Life, he thought, "Oh, this is a really smart person." Because doing all those steps, he had to be smart in order to do it. But if you looked that same way in the real world in San Francisco, your interpretation of him would be completely different. Right. So right. it does really matter where you are and what yes. circumstance. As artists, don't we sometimes don't we change, customize our bodies or our identities to do what we do? So like, I'm different on stage than I am off stage. Um, I wear things on stage I don't necessarily wear off stage. Whether it's an opera or a band or a panel discussion, you're 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 dressing the role. You're customizing. Whether, how curly is my hair going to be? What, you know, the, you know, the decorate. No, but I don't go into that behind green. I, I, you, you have more options. It sounds like in Second Life of customizing yourself than, than in in uh, the physical world. But I don't think it's such a foreign idea to customize oneself. And as artists, I, I, I mean, we're constantly transforming ourselves. I'm in the farmer mode. I'm in, and what does that look like? <laughs> or uh, you know, I'm diva mode. Or you know, so, so it's just. Um, to me, I don't think it's a matter of loss, it's a matter of gain, like how many possibilities do you have time and the imagination to explore? If we, if, if an organism without any body could try to do a second life, without the knowledge of how do you walk, how do you move your arms, how do you speak with people, I think we'll have a very, very hard time to relate to that kind of virtual interface, yeah. no? So, what I thought would be kind of fun and interesting to do is we've had this conversation about Second Life. We've had this conversation about uh, gender identity, physical identity, physical manifestation of gender identity. We've had these conversations, and then we have this group of people on Second Life that are still there, too. 
it would be kind of cool if we could bring all this together. Because it seems like we've had a, a several different conversations, and I'm wondering if you can tease out of that from your conversations, from what you've heard, some connective threads that sort of draw all this together around this issue of radical identities and how we understand ourselves. So um, let me throw that out as a topic and see if there's a, if anybody has a response to that. Am I what? <laughs> <laughs> In my dreams, honey. <laughs> I should look that good. <laughs> All right, so Javez has, a, has the mic. I, I think I cannot help but, but thinking that body be, seems to become really the, the central point of both conversations. And, uh, and then I... I go back thinking of uh, what Protagoras said that sort of uh, uh, man is the measure of everything, so the, of the one that exists because exists and the one that don't exist because they don't exist. And uh, so in a way we are measuring all our experiences, not only the one in the actual life, but the one in real life, uh, always through the body. And so I, even with that, all that uh, look, luxurious spirituality that we see in Second Life, that doesn't seem like we can get uh, away without the body. I mean, it's in a way kind of inescapable. That's the way I see it. And I want to say that in uh, kind of in a positive way. I mean, I'm not saying the body is a prison. It's just something with which we measure our experiences, whether they are in the actual uh, life or in a virtual world. So body, in my opinion, still remains the central theme. Great, over here. Do we just have the one mic? Yes, we could give you a lavalier and we could have two of those okay. passing around. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think one thing that's been running through um, some of the conversations is uh, we all have a desire to be understood and to be seen in the way that we see ourselves. And we use whatever it takes to, to make that happen, right? Um, and for some, it's a technology tool so that you can inhabit this physicality that is, that is you. And, and, and that you wanna be your truest self, your most genuine self to the people that are important to you. So you use whatever means necessary to achieve that, so so hopefully we're moving toward a space where we where that becomes easier, and that it um, that there is less uh, penalty to to inhabit your world in the the body that you see yourself as and, and the, the reality of your own identity. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally intrigued by that idea because it gets to the very idea of identity, right? And the role of the body in identity and the sort of dialogue that occurs between the physical and the mm, whatever this is, spiritual, whatever, um, sensibility of identity. And then um, I think particularly with Amos and the, some of the work that you've done, not having the physical determine the, the, the actual, but have the actual then determine the physical. And I can see that happening in Second Life as well, right? That my sense of who I am in my head I'm able to create physically, physically on Second Life, yeah? Well, this even goes beyond the idea, I think, of, you know, in the topic of discussion is radical identity. It seems to go, what, we're, what I'm hearing is we're going even beyond this topic of identity, that it's even beyond identity in the way of talking about true self and all of the different pieces that come with that and how can we fully be understood is sometimes, I'm, I'm just curious about that piece around how identity can support us when we find communities that we identify with, but how it can also sometimes even be limiting in connecting or mm -hmm. we talked about in one of our small groups around how possibility of dropping 
um, somebody used a word of removing some of that where you can be a fuzzy. I haven't done Second Life, but I'm learning a lot today. Um, and so being a fuzzy, you get to relate and express yourself outside of some of the typical identities that maybe in the physical world we see and we perhaps can't, um, it might potentially get in the way where sometimes also those identities support us in connecting where we relate to certain pieces. So I'm curious about this even idea of identity and how it relates to or if we're using it in the same way as true self or where we're going in this discussion. Great point. Great point. Somebody want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, the result of being a, an authentic uh, homeless desex fuzzy, uh, and you're briefly in the city, is everything that happens to you is a perfectly calibrated San Francisco incidence, and it's based on really simple codes that we all share, like the alphanumerics of the word no, or just uh, you know dialing out of the area code, the San Francisco directory system. And it's part of the deal that everyone ignores you because you're actually anti-computational. So I was at the Ray Kurzweil event a week ago and I'd never seen Half-Life uh, previous to two weeks ago and the characters on the screen at this event and in like a five second clip of his new documentary that he played, they happen to be the precise name of two of my kind of virtual friends. They're virtual in the sense that I almost never see them, but I just follow them through extra internet coincidences. And it's because there's so much on electronic networks that my contact with them is limited. So what I've found, it seems paradoxical, but there's actually an inverse relationship between authentic interesting coincidence and Use of electronic networks that you'd expect to deliver them at a heightened level of intensity just because they're ubiquitous and they have text searching capabilities, etc. But it's not the case. Oh, that's interesting. So, um, who wants to respond to that? That's great. Yeah, Cynthia. I think you're tying the lasso around the, the anchor of space, of like location is everything. A furry on the streets of San Francisco is very different than a furry on the streets of St. Louis or um, out in Watsonville or on a surfboard um, or in Second Life. Um, but what I'm taking from what you said, what, what, uh, what I could really pull from it was that, um, that it truly is about space, location, but that these people are recognizable to you, whether they're in the real world or in your virtual world. And the, and the ones that you are running into, and oddly enough, in the last month or so, through this venue of Second Life, of learning, like being introduced to it, is that you're finding that people are still recognizable, whether it's on the street or in a virtual world. And I think that is really interesting because that really comes to identity of how there's how you see yourself and there's how others see you and then there's what you don't know they know about you that you're revealing by who you are. Um, so I think it's very interesting because I do believe it comes down to location, uh, interpretation of location. And in our two convers in both sides of the conversations of, this, of the room, we were talking a lot about gender and race and and our interpretation of that today versus uh, in the physical world and how it translates in the virtual world. And so would people tr lose political power in playing for fun to change themselves? Would they change their political power? Which brought us to our, our second panelist group about the, um, the political power of a physical sexual change of your original plumbing and what that means in physical space and then going on tour and knowing there's a place where you feel comfortable being yourself and there's a place where you, you need a partner. Um, and I'll, let, I'll pass the mic, but I do believe it all comes down to physical space and I, that's what I heard you saying 
Um, but I also heard you saying that it's coming into your consciousness a lot in the last few weeks through this venue. Well, that's, I'm, that's, I'm fascinated by that. So identity, despite what we want to believe, is not actually personally constructed. It's environmentally constructed, whether we want to admit that or not. I think it plays a pretty big role. It plays a pretty big role, at least. Yes. Okay. So, so we also were talking about how we've been, you know, putting some work into our art and into our therapy to accept ourselves who we are. And the cha I, I know I would be challenged to go there and change my gender, my race, I'd be challenged. I've accepted my booty. Is like, so, <laughs> so there's this whole thing of like, oh yeah, let's go play. I'll become a big green plant, but I don't know if I want to play the politics game and change my gender and everything. When I, I'm, I'm, I'm in it, I'm, I've, I'm yeah. committed to what I've got going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just curious if other people felt that. I felt like, oh, this is dangerous. No, it's kind of... Well, um, and then I thought it could be really fun if I could let go enough. Uh, and so I'm, you know, I'm curious. I'm really curious about it. Actually, that, what's interesting to me, just parenthetically, about Second Life is the opportunity to go do that and see what study. happens. Because yeah. I can't do that in right. this life, right? Yeah. So I, in, yeah. in a moment, I want to throw in a comment. Yeah, would you? That'd be great. That'd be great. Because uh, we're trying to include the Second Life um, audience as well. So just... <clears throat> one quick uh, uh, point of my own and then throw in the one, because this issue will f first about like place and experimentation and being like, I'm very comfortable in my gender and sexuality as best I understand them. And it's been interesting to see about things I would do in Second Life that maybe I wouldn't feel like doing in the physical world, but might still sort of leak back. And your point about the coming back to the body is really interesting. You could have a virtual world without bodies, but people don't seem to want that. They almost always do seem to involve some kind of embodiment. But then the interesting question is, is a Facebook page a kind of body as well? In other words, is it limited to virtual worlds. And part of me wants to say no, because if I say a Facebook page is like a body, then everything becomes the body and then nothing is the body. And I don't like terms that mean everything, but then in a more adjective -y sense, could there be body-like aspects, embodiment-like aspects to things like your ha uh, Facebook page that we could learn from by studying how even like what Amos is doing in terms of, you know, pushing on these ways in which people think about embodiment could help us think about those kinds of things that don't obviously seem to be about the body that maybe are, are shaped by the way we think about embodiment. Now, one of the people here in Second Life just wanted to make a point from their discussion, because while you were in, we were in small groups, and forgive me, I, I didn't circulate as much as I wanted to because I'm so much multitasking and trying to keep them included. Um, one of them just wanted to make this point, and, and I'll see if they make any others, but so much research is framed from the beginning with the assumption that people will find avatars weird and are studying how to combat the problem. And I've seen that. Um, people in, in psychology sometimes who assume from the beginning that it's an addiction, that it's a problem, and it's like going to another country and starting a study of why people like you find people in those other country weird. And, and for me, having done research in Indonesia, that's a very powerful statement that, you know, to learn about uh, people who are different, you have to have a place of, of listening and empathy and not rushing to mm. judgment because throughout the history of technology, new technologies have always been accompanied by simultaneous utopic and dystopic narratives. It's either going to save the world or it's going to ruin the world. And we never seem to learn that it's, it's what we do with it. You know, it's in between. It's never simply one or the other. So that's a, a very powerful point that Chimera, one of the, the people here in Second Life, was making. Who's that? Is that a, is that, no? Um, I almost want to respond to that, but I don't know what to say about it yet. <laughs> um, but I think maybe more in response to what Cynthia said and um, just sort of about environmental, sort of sociological factors that are creating these things we're talking about. I feel left with this very strong notion that like identities are not radical. Like, just the whole kind of title of the day, like, we're framing and contextualizing everything. Like, people have reasons for doing things. Like, you know, Amos talked about his transition as, like, survival. Like, it just feels like I would wonder if any of these people would call their identity radical and maybe why we're calling them radical. I don't know. That's a really good point. I think that's really, I think you're totally right on. This whole conversation has unpacked that so much that it's just like, what are we, what, what's, where's the radical piece? Um, one of the questions, one of the things that I was going to um, talk to Amos about during our time was the idea of like being as a trans person put into a panel that's called Radical Identities. And, you know, like I, I, I've always felt that 
the whole idea of radical is something that gets projected onto you when you're on the outside, and it kind of ends up being this weirdly like othering term, and can be a way also of kind of dismissing your life, your opinions, because it's like it's so out there. You know, and I know that there's, of course, a reclaiming movement also to like identify as radical as like a really powerful kind of fuck you. But I just think it's it's interesting. I just feel like it's um it's really it, it can it, it's very presumptuous to to kind of ascribe a radicalness to essentially a stranger. It's because it's all what you're projecting onto them. You know. But don't you think there's also like I'm gonna just contend that a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's also the opposite, which is there's such a strong um, uh, uh, um, impetus, there's such a strong push to quote unquote normalize that I'm going to claim radical identity in order to reject what is a, a societal normative. Like I'm having this whole issue about the whole gay marriage thing, which I think is just like, why, you know, what, what's the big deal about, I, I deliberately want to be outside of that normativity. I think that's cool because you're choosing that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But then I, but then it, it can become its own weird tyranny too. Right. It's like, you know, here in right, San Francisco, right, right. do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah, God yeah. forbid you're fucking normative in any yeah, way. Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know why there's gay married marriage? Because some people are really normal and they want to get married. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, and like, that's true. That's true. I feel like, who cares? Go get married. But, um, but yeah, so it ends up like, I understand people claiming that for themselves for sure as a, as like a powerful response to aspects of culture that you don't identify with and that need more airtime, like that the dissent needs a lot more airtime. Right. But I just think that to project that on people can be really yeah, problematic yeah, yeah. because it's other, it's 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 often othering, you right. know, or right. it's like, yeah, there's well, there's often you, a chance. Who are you to, to call me radical, right? Yeah, right? you know, exactly. I mean, I've I've and and just uh, you know, in my because I've written a lot of memoir about my life, I've gotten, you know, there's I've had a number of reviews and things like that where things that. Um, that I've written about that seem to me really normal and basic get read as ra radical by people who I just think, maybe, I don't know, like, yeah, yeah, the, you yeah, know what I yeah, mean? And yeah, then it totally. can be, sometimes it's really cool because it's a way of like, um, it just depends on where it's coming from, I guess, you know what I mean? It can be really othering or it can be a way of somebody reaching out to you and being like, you're like me, we're, in this, we're on the same team. Right. But it's like, it's a little, it's tricky. Yeah, it is tricky. Legacy we've got to keep up of we're radical to you, but it's normal to us. We're living, we're living out the evolved human existence. We are your avatars. Yeah. We are your avatars. <laughs> exactly. 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 There it is. That's the tagline. We are your avatars. That's All totally right. true. Tom Tom has a couple comments from Second Life and then comments from the Second Life uh, audience I want to read back in a second, but also just your beautiful comment and yours as well. Just this idea of, of radical to push back on and the idea that, like in my Second Life research, I'm very often interested in, in what seems boring and banal often can be the most powerful. <clears throat> and you know, this point about gay marriage is so interesting in queer politics. It's a beautiful point because I've had people come up to me and say, you know, gay marriage is really, you know, we have to always oppose it because if we do that, it's going to be assimilation. And I'm like, okay, have you ever watched Star Trek? Do you know nothing about the Borg? <laughs> <laughs> do you have any idea of what assimilation can do to structures of power? Like, you know what I mean? Like, as if you can neatly stand outside, you know? And I just think that's such a beautiful point to make about we don't know always what is radical and not. We trick mm -hmm. ourselves if we think we, we know that. So just two more points from the Second Life audience, and sorry I have to switch back and forth. Um, one was just a right, thinking about Second Life itself, about they people in Second Life, and actually this is so interesting because Philip maybe could throw in a quick comment here. He's very interested in this, as I understand too, of like people being able to actually change the physics inside of Second Life. What if gravity pulled upwards? What if, you know, you can already make the sky red or something, but to really actually change the laws of physics in a virtual world there's, is possible. And so, but, and then, um, another comment here on the idea that you might lose something by changing representation. So I think this person is speaking back to your comment and others. Here's what I thought. What do cultures that believe having your picture taken steals part of your soul lose from that assumption? I would argue nothing unless they change their cultural assumptions to match ours more closely. Whether that's good or bad, now there's a question. Wow. Hmm. I mean, that's not my question, I mean, but that's a really interesting point. Um, so, yeah. Over here. Big I love the comment about the, the um, physics in, in Second Life, because I was thinking about this uh, uh, comment that you made earlier where you could separate out the physical 
um, from the avatars, and I don't actually agree with that. You can't separate out the physical. I mean, that's one of the issues I have is y you have to have a physical presence to be able to, a physical enablement to be able uh, uh, to, to be in a virtual world. There's no escaping it, even if it's through some kind of an accommodation. You're either speaking in to, to manage your avatars or you're touching something. I mean, the physical presence is the way that we actually interface with the virtual world. So you cannot escape it today. I mean, maybe in the future you can. I hope that you can, but today you can't. So there's always that experience flowing through the physical world into this mm -hmm. other physical, this other virtual world, which has physical properties. Yeah, now we're in agreement. In my book, I talk, and I didn't mean it in that way. There's, you have to have the physical in that sense, absolutely. Yeah, there was somebody in our group that said something like, you know, you have to have a, you have to be able to talk, you have to be able to type, you have to, you have to have physicality in order yeah. to even oh, yeah. participate. Yeah, back here. I'm, uh, I've taught a class on Harvard's virtual islands in Second Life for about seven semesters as a philo arde, and I'm developing World University and School, which is like Wikipedia with MIT OpenCourseWare. And what's fascinated me about teaching in Second Life is the possibility in, uh, for conversation um, that because it's kind of anonymized behind the avatar identities that can lead to a kind of radical voice because uh, the student-teacher relationship is uh, rewritten, for example, um, in the anonymity, in the creativeness of the avatar form, there are new possibilities for the dynamic, not only in appearance representation, but in um, conversation, the individual voices of avatars, but in the conversation that emerges as a consequence. Uh, so this is a fascinating conversation in real life between all of us, and anonymized, it might even offer more opportunities for radical thought, radical voice, radical conversation. So thanks for this. Anything else? I'm sorry, I have one more Yeah, please. <laughs> We've, we've got about five more minutes. I know so I'm over my it. quota. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but in, our, in the first question about like, did you need a do you need a physical body for your identity? I, I still can't get over the thought because it, it triggers in me the thought of uh, the spirituality of your spirit and your soul, and you and you don't necessarily need to be alive for your soul to exist. And and I'm a, a little surprised it hasn't come up. <laughs> Not because I'm so radically brilliant, <laughs> but because maybe I'm just on my own little thing here. But to me, this is like creating this other world. And up until another world could exist online, the other world was heaven or hell. So I see some, you know, I hear the big biblical bell going off. Like these people are existing because someone's driving it who's still alive. Right? right, and if and when we read about souls and people and characters, we look at pictures of them because we're thinking of their physical self. But you know, are there are there people out there saying that not these not all these people really are being driven by real people? I said it. I didn't. Just a, just a couple quick comments on that. There's a reason why the term avatar comes from Hindu cosmology. It comes from religion. And there's actually a lot of interesting religious stuff that happens in Second Life. And there are debates, first of all, about bots, like automatically controlled avatars. But what I found more interesting in these spaces is cases where the physical world person who controls an avatar has died. Some good friends of mine have died for various reasons in the physical world. And if you don't have a physical body, you can't be in. But then debates that other people have about should someone animate that avatar um, to have a kind of memorial service where that person is back in Second Life as an avatar. And in the majority of cases that I've seen during my own research, the decision has been no. That it would just be too disturbing for people to see. I'm sure there are some cases, but in the, the main cases that I know, so like the Sojourner, who is a very good friend of mine who was a major figure in the disability movement in Second Life and was one of two people to read the manuscript of my book before it was published, passed away. And, um, and she was a very dear friend, and when she died, they had memorials for her in Second Life with candles and all this kind of stuff. Um, and my, my book Inside of Second Life is dedicated to her, um, but there was a decision to not animate her avatar, that it was just, that there was too much of her soul in it. And that was an interesting, you know, for me as an outsider, but also as an insider, because I, she was someone I liked very much, 
Um, that was a really interesting moment. Yeah. That. Did someone ask? Oh, someone wanted to ask Phil, uh, Philip, why um, he chose the name Avatars. Sure. Well, as, as Tom said, the the word itself was coined uh, some years earlier by uh, early virtual world folks. I, I don't even quite. Perhaps to use it, yeah. yeah. So it was it was used before, but we, as we built Second Life, thought it was a very apt uh, uh, word to use. We we toyed with a lot of words. I, I actually had a time where I thought we shouldn't use it because, practically speaking, I was concerned that it was too unusual a word and that people just wouldn't get it. And we had a lot of stuff they weren't going to get about Second Life, and I didn't want to add the name of what that digital representation of you is. But yeah, the word avatar is a wonderful word because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Hindu word, a Sanskrit word that means that the incarnation on earth of a god. So Jesus is an avatar. Uh, Muhammad is an avatar. It's the, it's the, the appearance of a god in, on, you know, on, on, a, on earth clothed in human form. So it's kind of a neat idea because in, indeed this whole debate about with you know what our identity is, uh, there's a lot of thinking we do about whether we are ourselves when we're projected into there. And I thought the 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 idea of the avatar, the word avatar, was very powerful that way because we would be able to go into the virtual world and uh, perhaps like gods in some sense be our be ourselves as best we could or or be as free as we could in that digital space. And so I loved that the name for that reason. That's really, um, um, that's really deep, Cynthia. I, um, and it sort of t t tracks a little bit with what Vicky said earlier too about having to be phys physical in order to be there. But if one believes that there is a spirit, can the spirit inhabit an avatar irrespective of the physicalness of the, I don't know. <laughs> okay, let's call it a day. Thanks, everybody. That's great. I want to thank Philip and Tom and Michelle and Amos for. Um, for being here and really uh, stimulating our thinking and our ideas. I want to thank Joelle and all the rest of the team at YBCA for organizing this, Ren and Nick and uh, everybody who's been, Laurel, everybody's in, Jose, the crew, thank you crew. Um, everybody has been involved in making this happen. We have two more of these conversations left. Um, the next one is on the environment and uh, uh, we'll feature Adam Werbach who is like the youngest ever um, president or whatever of the Sierra Club who was very controversial for, for wanting environmentalism to be a, a, a thing that isn't just for wealthy white people who can afford to shop at Whole Foods. Um, uh, and then the second one after that, the last one, in, that one's in May, in, in May, right, Isabel? May 7th. May 7th. And then Joel Shepard, our film curator, is organizing on June 11th. Um, on technology, and uh, among others, we have uh, Jaron Lanier, who's going to be part of that, who questions whether or not technology is either, either, as, as, as amazing as we think it is So for our lives. So uh, anyway, it should be good. Don't miss them. Um, the exhibition is open. Song Dong um, is an incredible exhibition. And then upstairs, you and McDonald, you're welcome to uh, wander through the galleries. And I think we have the bar. Am I correct that we have the bar? No bar today? Oh, no bar. <laughs> OK, but the galleries are open. Anyway, thanks a million, you guys. Folks, please thank you and please write us. If this is still going on in your heads, we'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear about it. Thank you.